Hey everybody, I'm Jordan with Warp Fire Minis. We're keeping on with our Start Playing series, and today's faction is Sylvaneth. So let's dive into what makes them work. So we're starting off with the strengths and weaknesses, and the number one strength of Sylvaneth is mobility. Like, it's the complete identity of your army, it's what makes everything work, and the two main parts of that are your army abilities. We can strike and fade, and then we can walk the hidden paths. And so what those do is walk the hidden paths lets you, if you're wholly within nine inches of one of your wildwoods, you can teleport away from it to an overgrown terrain piece or another wildwood. You can also teleport from an overgrown terrain piece as well. So just a once per turn in your turn, you can teleport. Uh, you got to end nine inches away from an enemy, but just teleports, they get you on objectives, they get you near enemies, they get you away from enemies. Like it's just one of the best tools in the game. And then even better than that is strike and fade. So with that one is in combat, after you finish attacking with a unit, once per turn, you can pick that unit up and just teleport them out of combat. So that means that you get to hit somebody and you don't even get hit back. And that's just an incredible tool. And what plays into that is we're a very elite army. So we don't have a ton of units on the board. Like some armies will have 13, 14 different units. We're gonna go in somewhere between like seven to 10 in most lists. So we gotta keep our stuff alive. What's the best way to do that? Don't even get hit. So teleport out, make sure you're using that teleport to get in position and then that strike and fade to get back out. Um, after that, the other good thing about the book is just most of the stuff's pretty good. Um, some armies, there's like one list that's the best list, and that's the list you have to run. But Sylvaneth, like you can run Kurnoth Heavy, or you can run the Revenant Seekers Heavy, or you can run Alariel or Durthu. Like pretty much most of the stuff in the book is good. So it's nice having a good variety for list building. All right, on the weakness side of things, I'm gonna say we're an elite army again. And the downsides of that, again, we don't have a lot of bodies for holding objectives. Um, if we do lose whole units, it really, really hurts us and you just have to be really careful. Um, we do have really good saves on most of our army, but we don't have any real mortal wound protection. Um, we can get a six up ward in one of the sub factions, that's okay. We can get a five up ward via a spell, it's hard to get it off, so we're very elite, the mortal wounds hurt, uh, you just gotta play around it. And then one downside of the army is terrain. So not only are we buying and building and painting our army, we're buying and building and painting terrain. So you can start out with just one box of Wildwoods to get started, but you have to have at least one set. Then you're really gonna wanna have two and maybe even three, depending on how often you're summoning in more trees. So that's one thing that's a little bit of a bummer. I, I think the trees are really cool. Having terrain be an impactful part of the game is fun, but it is one thing to keep in, keep in mind. The last downside's gonna be that it's a pretty technical army to play. So again, very elite. If you miss position and you lose one of your big units, it's gonna be a struggle the rest of the way out. Um, there's a lot of measuring involved. So you have to stay within nine inches of those wild woods. You have to teleport nine inches away. Your arch revenant's got a bubble aura for plus one to wound. So there's a lot to keep track of and just make sure that you're doing things very intentionally. You, you have to make sure that everything is within these ranges exactly. If you pile in and combat and end up outside of nine and then you can't strike and fade out, like that could just straight lose you the game. So it's a tough army to play, but also a very rewarding one once you get it down. For Sylvaneth, we have to pick a glade and a season. And there's a few of them to choose from, but I'm only gonna cover like the most common ones, basically the good ones that you'll see. For the glades, we're gonna start out with Heartwood. So that one, it makes Kurnoth battle line, which is really good. And then we get to pick three enemy units and get plus one to hit for the whole game against those for our whole army. So that saves us a ton of command points where we don't have to issue all out attacks because we already got it for free. And pretty much everything in the book, like we're hitting on threes on most stuff. So going down to hitting on twos, like that's where we want to be. So that, that's what makes Heartwood strong. Um, the next most common one you'll see is going to be Gnarlwood. And Sylvaneth, the spell casting is really, really good but we don't really have any good bonuses to cast. So the best we have is the War Song at plus one. So what Gnarlwood does is once per turn when you're casting a spell, you can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 and then pick the best two. So it helps you get that one important spell cast, whether it's summoning in another tree or trying to cast the Spite Swarm Hive or going for the War Song Bomb. Like it helps you that one key thing you need to happen. It helps make it happen. 
and that's probably the most popular one after heartwood. Then the last one I'll go over is oak and brow, and that's just one if you want to run monster mash, you want to have a bunch of tree lords and spirited dirthus running around. It makes it to where all of those don't bracket at all um, until they're on their very last wound, and so. Durthu at top bracket, he's swinging for flat six damage a piece on those swords. Uh, then it brackets down to like D6 and all that stuff, which are huge drops. So if you go Oak and Brow, it just keeps everybody on that top bracket and helps them just kick butt. Then after you pick your Glade, you've got to pick a season. There's only two that are seeing a lot of play. Um, number one is the Burgeoning. And that gives you, if your units are wholly within nine of one of your Wildwoods or Overgrown, you get a six up ward. And we have really good saves. We have no mortal wound protection at all. So this is our one way to get a six up ward. It's nice. Um, six ups is not always gonna happen, but when it does, it feels good. And sometimes that, that's gonna be the difference in what keeps your unit alive. So it's a solid season. And again, the most, probably the most popular one, it's gonna be the dwindling. And that just lets you reroll a cast once per turn in your turn. Um, you need those spells to go off. So we can roll 3d6 with the other glade. So this season, we're getting to reroll that to try and make sure our spells go off. So that's why that one's a really popular pick. All right, then we're gonna go through the command traits and artifacts for the army. Uh, for command traits, there's only three that are really seeing play. And number one on the list is the Spellsinger. That lets uh, one of your casters, usually the Warsong, you can cast one of your spells through the Awakened Wildwoods. So you can summon a tree way out front and then use that as the target of your Warsong bomb to try and hit a big chunk of the enemy's army. Um, so that one, just incredible. That's kind of the gimmick that makes the Warsong work. You're gonna see it in 90% of Sylvaneth lists. The other two, you've got Warsinger. That lets you put, you put it on your general and everybody within a certain range of him gets plus three inches to their move. And you'll see that for people, some people just abandon magic altogether. Like they're tired of techless auto unbinding their stuff or whoever else has got plus three or plus four with thank wall, just unbinding all your spells. You get frustrated. You say, well, I'm just gonna go war singer. I'm just gonna move fast. You can't stop it. Here we go. And it's good. Like Kern off and going from a five inch move to an eight inch move feels really good. Uh, but more often than not, you're still gonna see spell singer. Uh, it's just a little bit better. Then the last one you'll see sometimes is called Gnarled Warrior. And that's usually going on Durthu and it makes him ethereal which means his save can't be modified at all. So he's saving on that three up base, just no matter what. So it just makes him super tanky. But again, more often than not, it's gonna be Spellsinger. Like that's kind of the best one. Then when it comes to artifacts, there's really only two to talk about. Uh, the first one's gonna be the Vesperal Gem. That one, you put it on a wizard, you can automatically cast one of your spells from the spell lore. So things like Regrowth to heal or Tree Song to try and get some extra rend. So that's solid. And the other one, is the Greenwood Gladius. That's pretty much going on Durthu every single time. It lets you get an extra D3 attacks on his big sword. So he's three attacks base, four if he's near a tree, then add D3. These things are six damage a piece, so like Greenwood Gladius, thumbs up. All right, so let's jump into the standout units for Sylvaneth. Again, most of the book's pretty good. There's a couple that didn't make the list, and that doesn't mean they're unplayable, but these are the ones you're gonna see more often than not. First up's gonna be Alario. She's the goddess of life, the creator of the Sylvaneth, and she's pretty good. Uh, she can move 16 inches. She's got a three up save. She can heal herself. She can, when she dies, bring herself back to life. She can summon in another unit. She can cast three spells, but she doesn't have any bonuses to cast. Figure that out, I don't know. Uh, one of the downsides is she's 820 points. So like, that's a huge chunk of your army, but she can summon in like 250-ish points worth of things. So. She's really costing you about 570 points. Does that make her War Scroll worth it? Um, in a lot of successful tournament lists, you do see her, so yes. Um, she's not my personal favorite. I don't like having that many points tied up in one unit. I'd rather have a couple things cruising around the board, but she is solid. You will see her. If you like her, bring her. She's gonna work out. Next up are our Tree Lord heroes. We've got the Spirit of Durthu and the Tree Lord Ancient. The Tree Lord Ancient, his gimmick is he can summon in one Awakened Wildwood anywhere on the battlefield, and that's really, really good. Uh, people will pair that with the Warsong again, the Warsong Bomb, based on this tree you just automatically set up on the board. I'm not a huge fan again, just it's a lot of points just for that one ability. After he gets that out, he can do okay. 
Uh, but I'd rather just put my points elsewhere, like a Spirit of Durthu. So this guy slaps. Uh, he's got three attacks, but they do six damage apiece. Then you get near a wood, you get that extra attack, you put the Greenwood Gladius. So for a big hammer unit, this is, this is kind of your guy. Sometimes with Durthu, things can be a little bit swingy. So you've got those few attacks. Sometimes you're gonna do 24 damage. Sometimes you're gonna do six or zero, but we can strike and fade, baby. So if we go in there, we hit and we whiff, just teleport him out, keep him safe. We'll try again next time. And then the other thing Durthu can do for us is he can do a monstrous rampage to make somebody fight last. And making somebody fight last just rules. It lets you do a different fight somewhere else that's gonna be more important. And you get to see how that pans out, decide if you wanna strike and fade out of that one. And if you don't, if you wipe that whole unit, now you've got Durthu, he gets to fight into this thing first. And again, if he whiffs, we can, we can pull him out. But more often than not, like I've had really good look out of Durthu. I put him in most of my lists. Next up is the Warsong Revenant. And the whole focus of the General's Handbook right now is the Galatian Champions. And the Warsong is just one of the best Galatian Champions in the game. Uh, they got seven wounds, a four up ward, and this is the one you're gonna give Spellsinger. Uh, you're gonna usually give it that Best Pearl Gem artifact as well. And the whole shtick, everything that makes it work, you're gonna be casting that Warsong Bomb. You're gonna use Spellsinger to cast from the tree you're standing next to onto a tree somewhere else on the battlefield near your whole enemy's army. And it casts on a seven, so you're gonna roll your two dice. Then you get to roll dice equal to the casting roll. So you're hoping you get like a 10 or 11 or something crazy. Then you get to roll those 10 dice for each enemy unit that's within nine inches of that wildwood. So a lot of times, if you can position that wildwood correctly, like you can take out a huge chunk of your enemy's army with every time you cast the spell. And so you get to do that every turn. So this is the one where if they're running Gnarl Root, this is the one they're rolling 3d6 on. Then they're using the Dwindling to reroll this. Like they're using this as a huge chunk of the damage output from their army. And with that four up ward, like, it's hard to take it out. So just really, really good piece. And again, you're gonna see it in most lists. Next up is another really good GC, the Arch Revenant. And so this guy, he can move 12 inches, which is super fast for a GC. Um, he can get a four up ward in combat and all Kurnoth units wholly within 12 get plus one to wound. There aren't a ton of effects in the game that give plus one to wound. So like this is really powerful, especially in combo with like Heartwood. So, now we're plus one to hit and plus one to wound. So those Kurnoth swords are sized, like we're hitting on twos, wounded on twos. And even on top of that, he's got a command ability where we can choose any Sylvaneth unit and give him plus one to their attacks characteristic. So that really takes those Kurnoth to the next level or even Durthu, if you just want to have an extra swing with that six damage sword, like go for it. This guy's solid. And the last hero we're going to talk about is Draika. And she's one of my favorites. I put her in most of my lists. This one's more of a personal preference though. Um, She's a monster, she moves nine inches, and she's really good at shooting. Uh, I'm kind of a sucker for shooting stuff, so this does it for me. Um, the deal is the whole army, like you can pick one unit and teleport it nine inches away from an enemy unit. And so Draika, she's got a 12 inch shooting attack and it does 20 attacks. Yeah, you get to choose a mood for her to be in at the beginning of each battle round where you can make her plus 10 attacks to her shooting attack or plus 10 attacks to her melee attack. You're gonna go shooty Draika almost every single time, unless you know like you're gonna be in combat for both phases, like in your turn and the opponents, which is kind of hard to guarantee. So I go shooty Draika, that way I'm getting the most when I shoot, I don't have to hit a charge for it to be effective. And if they choose to charge me, I'm getting a really good unleash hell. But it's 20 attacks. If we're Heartwood, we're hitting on twos, wounded on threes, rend one, one damage each. And every six to hit is a mortal wound. So when you factor in that Heartwood bonus, you can teleport nine inches away from something, and then on average, you're doing like 10 damage just from this one shot, which that could clear a screen or just take a big chunk out of a monster that you're gonna charge other stuff into. Just 10 damage in shooting is a lot. Um, she's only got 10 wounds, so kinda on the frail side. She does have a three up save, but you can't just throw her way out front. Yeah, if the whole enemy army can just collapse on her, like they're going to kill her, you'll get your unleash hell at least, but try and put her normally behind something else. Like if I know I'm charging in somewhere, I'll teleport her over there by them, do that extra damage to help that combat that I need for my battle tactic probably. And just, just a really good support piece that she can go out and still kill something where you need it. Now we're getting into the battle line options for the army. Um, we've got tree revenants. They don't do a lot other than teleport every turn, which is incredible. So 
You can use them to score easy desecrates, go cap objectives if the opponent leaves them. Um, but that's all they do, but like, that's huge. So Tree Revenants, huge thumbs up. Then the other variant is Spite Revenants, and point for point, they can do a lot of damage, but to get the most out of them, you gotta put them in the Glacian Veteran Battalion. Then they're frail. Um, you don't see it a ton. They're just not my favorite. Next up are Dryads, and Dryads, I think, are really good. Uh, in the last General's Handbook, we had Bounty Hunters, where you got a bonus damage versus battle line, so Dryads were pretty much dead. But now that that's gone, uh, Dryads, if they're wholly within nine of an Awakened Wildwood or Overgrown, they are minus one to hit and minus one to wound from all attacks. So that turns this 10-man unit into something that is very hard to kill and something that opponents are often going to underestimate. Like they're going to throw one of their medium hammer units into it thinking, oh, this is a guaranteed kill. And then that minus one, minus one, it's going to give them the opportunity to fail a battle tactic, which is, that's, that's our dream come true. So Dryad's solid. Next up is everybody's favorite, the Kurnoff. So with Kurnoffs, we can build them with scythes, swords, or bows. And the real deal is swords versus scythes for your melee guys. If you're running a unit of three, the swords on average do like an extra one or one and a half damage. And they're six to hit proc two mortal wounds, so you're getting some mortal wound output. So for a unit of three, I pretty much always go swords. Uh, for a unit of six, I always go scythes. And the reason why they're two damage each, they have rend three, which like there's not very many things in the game that have rend three, so that's really good. But with the unit of six, the scythes have a two inch reach. And so all of them can attack and you can keep them like tight in like two ranks. And so that makes them easier to keep in range of those wildwoods for the strike and fade situations. It makes them easier to fit in tight spots for when you do teleport and just making sure all six of them can attack is a big deal. Um, we could run six swords instead, but due to coherency being over a unit of five, we're only gonna be able to get four of them in. Um, once one of them dies, then we're down to five. That's not an issue anymore, but it's still, to get them all in combat, it's a really big footprint. And so we might end up piling ourselves out of that strike and fade distance, or if we're trying to stay in range for that ward or the Arch Revenant's bubble, there's just a lot of things where having a huge footprint can be kind of a negative. So unit of three go swords, unit of six go scythes. And then Kern off bows. When you look at the base profile for them, they don't look great. But once we consider the Heartwood bonus for plus one to hit, and the Arch Revenant bonus for plus one to wound, that also applies in the shooting phase. So we can get those guys down to threes to hit, twos to wound, rend one, two damage. Um, each unit of three Kurnoff bows on average into a four up save does about five damage. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if we have two or three units of those guys, now that's 10 or 15 damage we can shoot 30 inches away. And Again, that can help us clear screens or take a big chunk out of something that we need to kill for our battle tactic. And since we are elite and we don't want to lose units, these are guys we can just keep safe. Like we're gonna strike and fade that one unit per turn, hit something and get out. And so while we're doing that, we can also be contributing with our other units on the board instead of just sitting there. So 30 inch range, they're pelting stuff while your one unit's diving in and diving out. Um, they're just really good. Next up is the Revenant Seekers and the Spite Rider Lancers. Uh, these are your Bug Rider guys. And I'm a huge fan of the Rev Seekers over the Spite Riders. So Spite Riders, they can fight first when they charge, pretty good. They're one damage each, which is pretty good into a lot of things that are reducing damage now. So if you're fighting into Petrifex Bone Reapers or Coalesce Seraphon or Cruel Gas with Night Haunt, the Spite Riders are gonna be better. But in all the other cases, the Revenant Seekers, they do more damage and they have a couple tricks up their sleeve. So we're gonna look down at the table and I'll show you what they can do. All right, so here's a couple really cool things that Revenant Seekers can do for us. Um, at the end of the movement phase, you get to pick a friendly unit wholly within 12. And then on a two up, you get to bring a model in that unit back to life. And like that alone is really good, but we can use that in a sneaky way to get us an extra like charge bonus. Like, if we fail the Spite Swarm Hive and that Gur Battle Mage doesn't go off, we can still do this to try and make a long charge. So how it works is at the end of the movement phase is when we bring the guys back, but also at the end of the movement phase is when we can do our uh, once per turn teleport. 
when things happen simultaneously, we get to pick the order. So what we can do is we'll take this unit of Revenant Seekers over here. They're obviously wholly within nine of this tree. So we're gonna teleport them over here, keeping them wholly within nine of this tree. We have to stay outside of nine inches of an enemy unit. So we measure that out. You're gonna to have to do that every single time. You wanna be exact, it's very important. And then we roll our dice. So on a two up, we can bring back one of the guys in our own unit because we lost one. And so the cool part here is we get to choose where to put it back. And it just has to be within an inch of one of the models in the unit. So we're nine away, but we can set this guy up a full inch. Like we have to be just within an inch of this guy straight towards the enemy. And so what that does for us is we were a nine inch charge. Now we're a six inch charge. And so that just increased our odds exponentially of making this charge roll. And now boom, we're getting in. Plus we brought a guy back to life. That's really good. Then let's say a different situation if all these guys are still alive. We can still do the same thing. We have this unit of three. We're gonna teleport them over here. Let's say this unit of Kurnoff moved up and they're seven inches away from their charge. Like on a two up, we can bring a Kurnoff model back to life instead. So they're, they're seven inch charge. We set it up within an inch. Like they're gonna gain back like about two inches of charge range. So now they're only gonna need that four or five inches to make it in. So bringing guys back to life, making your charges easier. Uh, you can even do things like if you're in combat already with something, you can bring back a model to the unit and like tie something else up into combat with it. Or you can go over here and get on an objective. Just there's lots of opportunities that this gives you that just makes it a really good add. And I'll go through and I'll add some Sylvaneth lists to the description of this video. If you want to check those out that could take advantage of situations like this and just give you a good leg up on the game. And the last unit we're going to talk about are Tree Lords. And again, if you're running an Oaken Brow list, like you can have a whole army of just these guys. And what makes them work is they have their own War Scroll ability like Durthu, where if they're wholly within six of a Wildwood or Overgrown, they can teleport themselves. And so that means you could have four or five Tree Lords all teleport in the same turn. They have a pretty decent shooting attack. So you can like, if you're all the way on the right hand side of the board, you could literally teleport your entire army over to the left for a huge reposition, hit a bunch of these shots into them, do a bunch of damage, try and hit some charges, but they're just very, very mobile, which is kind of rare for a big monster like that. They also have the fight last stomp like Durthu does. Um, being a monstrous rampage, you can only do it with one of them uh, for each turn. So like everybody can't fight last everything. You gotta pick your spot, but fight last just really good. They swing, they do pretty good damage in melee. So just overall really good all round unit where they can do a little bit of everything. We also have endless spells. And the only one worth talking about is the Spite Swarm Hive. So this guy cast on a seven, but we can reroll the cast, 3d6 cast it, all those buffs. And what it does is we get to put it down on the board, pick a unit in range, and on a two up, we get plus three to our charge rolls. So our whole gimmick is the armies, we can teleport around, we get that nine inches away from an enemy. With that plus three now, we only need a six inch charge. You can reroll the charge, so six up rerolling, like you're pretty much gonna make it in, which is awesome. Um, then there's also the battle mage, a battle wizard of Gur, And that's another little guy some people will ally in, and he can give somebody plus two to their charge rolls. And you can stack that on the same unit as the spite swarm. So we could have a unit that's plus five to charge, teleport them, they only need a four inch charge to make it in, just makes the army incredibly mobile. And like that's our whole identity, that's what we want to do. Last but not least is gonna be the battle tactics and grand strategies from the book. Um, all of the grand strategies are straight garbage. Don't ever run them, period. Um, for the battle tactics, we do have a few really good ones. Number one is harness the spirit paths. And so this season battle tactics can be tough and this guy is just a freebie. Um, the wording on it is that you have to complete a charge with a unit that was set up by your army abilities, like one of your teleports, but it lets you do it if you strike and fade. So you have a three inch charge somewhere, you can charge that unit in easily. Then as long as you're within range of the Wildwood, you can teleport out and boom, that's a battle tactic complete. So that guy, you're gonna be able to complete that every game. It's great. Um, the other one we have is Eradicate Trespassers. You pick a unit within six inches of a Wildwood and you kill it. Um, again, just good to have some versatility, have some options. We can even summon in the tree like the turn before near an enemy unit. 
then choose that one as the target the next turn. So that's great. And the last one is the March of the Forest Lords. And again, more for uh, Oak and Brow list, or if you're running a Durthu. Um, it's if a Tree Lord or Durthu kills an enemy monster. So it's not one you're gonna have every game, like some enemies, they're just not gonna bring a monster at all, or they're gonna have a big monster like Kron Spine or something that you can't even kill. So it's good when it's available. Um, not always my first pick, but again, just having options for battle tactics, that's great. So that's the scoop on Sylvaneth. Just use that mobility. Make sure you stay in ranges for all your aura abilities. Uh, cast your sweet spells, do a bunch of damage. Hopefully those Durthu swings make it through and just go out there and win some games. Uh, thanks for watching. And if you ever need models, check us out at warpfireminis.com.